Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Sandra Hyde, a licensed professional engineer and managing director of product development for the International Code Council, ICC, the product development group, as well as John Buddy Showalter, also a licensed professional engineer and a senior staff engineer with the International Code Council's product development group. Sandra and Buddy authored a five-part series in Structure Magazine discussing significant structural changes to the 2021 International Building Code. And in this episode, they will tell us more about these significant changes and how it will affect structural engineers. I'm your co-host, Nat McArdle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Sandra and Buddy. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by Collier's Engineering and Design. Collier's Engineering and Design is a multidisciplinary engineering firm with over 1,800 employees in 63 offices nationwide and growing fast. Collier's Engineering and Design maintains an internal culture that is nurtured through the promotion of integrity, collaboration, and socialization. Their employees enjoy hybrid work environments, continuous career advancement, health and wellness offerings, and programs and projects that have a positive impact on society. Collier's Engineering and Design stays on the cutting edge of technology and their entrepreneurial approach to expansion provides personal and professional development opportunities across the firm. Leadership's dedication to the well-being of their employees and their families is demonstrated throughout the wide range of benefits and programs available to them. For more information, visit the career page on their website at colliersengineering.com. Sandra and Buddy, welcome to the show. In your own words, could you both please tell our listeners about yourselves and what you do on a day-to-day basis? Maybe, Sandra, you can start us off. Okay. Uh, So on a day-to-day basis, I end up looking at whatever questions happen to come in that people are asking about the code. So it might be on the 2021, 2018, 2015, 2012. Who knows? Uh, It might be the IRC or the IBC or the IEBC. I might be working on a book that we're producing to talk about changes to the code. I might be working on um, review of somebody else's books that want to have the ICC logo or have us publish them. Or I might be teaching. Oh, that's awesome. It sounds like you have a very, very diverse day. How about you, buddy? So very similar. Sandra and I work in the same uh, product group here at ICC. Uh, Sandra is the veteran. I'm the rookie. And so I'm learning a lot from her. Um, And so I help with those uh, support documents as well. And we develop a lot of training materials that we use to take out then uh, into the, the field to teach code officials primarily but um, our audience is pretty wide, Um, building officials, fire officials, um, engineers, architects, uh, even builders will show up for our um, programs. And I came to ICC three years ago from the American Wood Council where I was involved with developing the mass timber provisions. And so that's sort of a niche within ICC where I am the point person for tall mass timber. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, For any of the students that aren't too familiar with ICC, International Code Council, uh, once you get into the industry, for sure, you will be using a lot of their resources. uh, So you might as well get to get familiar with them now. Uh, Sandra, I wanted to ask you about how did you decide to become an engineer and (laughs) what, uh, what habits have proven helpful to you? So how I decided to become an engineer, I was a middle school and high school math and science teacher and said, you know, I'm kind of bored with what I'm doing and I'd like to make houses safer in an earthquake. So that in my thirties was how I decided to go back to school, get an engineering degree. Um, And along the way have managed to find a niche where I can actually help make buildings safer in an earthquake. Uh, As far as students, you know, For me, engineering was not something I had anybody in my life that they did it. And so I knew it. And so I really think 
when you find something that's interesting to you, you need to find some people who do it and ask them to actually see what they do. It's by far the easiest way to uh, um, get a glimpse into what happens within the world, whatever job you're looking for. And it really is okay to just ask people, even though it's scary, to do so. No, that's great, Sandra. And I'm, I, it's interesting that you bring up that you were a teacher beforehand, because I, um, I used to work with a guy who was a teacher before he became an engineer. And then also like when I first started in design, I had a supervisor and she was actually a teacher and then went back, I think in her early thirties after she had her first two kids and got her engineering degree. And uh, that was also her kind of path to success in engineering. So I, <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. I think also, Matt, we've talked to someone else who had a similar story uh, a couple episodes back. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but it's so, it's so interesting that that is a um, common path. Uh, so Sandra, if you, if you don't mind, what made you decide to work for ICC specifically rather than, you know, I work for a manufacturer and Matt works for a design firm. So I worked for warehouser slash trust choice slash I level first and um, the university I was at didn't have a lot of research going on. I wanted to do research. So I went uh, to Warehouser, did the research, found that, ooh, that day-to-day -day do the same thing, test it again and again. For me, was very tedious. And I actually didn't know what I was going to be doing next. But I got laid off in 2009 in the midst of cycle after cycle of layoffs. And ICC actually contacted me to ask if I would do some review of work. And um, I did that. And at the same time, I happened to get my PE license and they liked my reviews well enough that they asked if I would join our group that works on writing, which I had never done before. <laughs> um, and because the job is so varied in what you do day to day, I have loved it for more than 10 years now. Very cool. Yeah, I know that's, I think everyone tries to find that, that position where they're challenged every day mm -hmm. and each of us is different and we find it in our different ways. And it goes to show that, you know, I, I think most young engineers think, oh, I'm going to be a design engineer, you know, if they go in the structural engineering field, but uh, as we've proven time and time again, there's so many fields in structural engineering uh, where you can get that. You may not like the design field. Maybe you might want to try something else and there's so many career paths. So thanks for sharing that, Sandra. Um, buddy, uh, I know you're working on some mass timber uh, stuff and at, at least in the industry, even in Southern California, that's that's been picking up a lot. And I know you've been working on that. Uh, could you explain to our listeners that aren't too familiar with, with mass timber and uh, what it is and how they can get more familiar with it? Yeah, so in our country, if you've been to some, some restaurants that may have been turned over from an old mill building into a restaurant that had these big, massive, heavy timber um, members inside the building, a lot of old mills and buildings back in the day were built just... What, what has been known uh, throughout the, the trade as heavy timber. And those types of buildings have been in the building code for decades, literally since some of the very first building codes um, have been around. In Europe and Canada over the past uh, few decades, I guess, um, they, with the advent of a product called cross laminated timber, they've been able to take these buildings even bigger taller and, and larger um, because of new technology. Engineered wood products are uh, making it easier to, to build larger um, mass timber products that can be used in these applications. And so around 2015, 2016, the ICC Board of Directors appointed a, a task group, uh, an ad hoc committee to develop these new provisions in the US building code. So in the 2021 IBC, we now have provisions for three new types of construction, type 4A, 4B, and 4C. And those are in addition to the, what we call the legacy heavy timber 
provisions that are still there in the code, but with the three new types of construction, we can go taller and um, have larger areas. Yeah, that's really interesting. I um, I had the opportunity to attend Structures Congress and mass timber was a very, very hot topic. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting was a specific, I'm not super familiar with mass timber, but my Canadian counterparts are, but um, one of the things that kept popping up was the fire safety around mass timber. So, you know, what are some of the main fire safety requirements for mass timber types of constructions? I know with CLT, it may be different from just what would regularly be like a stick built building. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, these these new buildings, mass timber, heavy timber, are nothing like their um, stick frame counterparts. And so there are two ways in the code to develop uh, fire protection. One's uh, active protection, one's passive protection. So active protection involves things like sprinklers. And so any of these buildings that are going to go taller and larger than our existing heavy timber buildings have to have an NFPA 13 sprinkler system to get those additional heights and areas. Additionally, the passive protection comes in the form typically of a fire rated gypsum. And so for the, the new types of construction, um, gypsum will also be used to protect uh, certain portions of the mass timber building elements. Now, mass timber also has an inherent fire resistance. And so we can design a beam or a column, for example, or a CLT panel for a certain fire resistance, say one hour, and we can add additional non-combustible protection like gypsum to add additional time say if we need a two or three hour assembly. So it's, a, it's a, gonna be a combination of active and passive protection, but all these are all engineered design structures um, for uh, the new types of construction. Thanks for that, buddy. Uh, Sandra, I, I wanted to change directions to um, the 2021 uh, load changes. I know that's a big topic and that's something that, you know, structural engineers are always interested in. Could you explain what those are? Okay. Um, well, first off, since we are in the second cycle of the IBC that's using ASCE 716, there are very few, which is good. We, we kind of like to see a, a code cycle where there aren't a huge number of changes. Um, probably the most useful that structural engineers can do that help everybody else in the uh, process of building the building is that the component and cladding um, wind zones that you've got laid out since the wind zones, especially for flat buildings change so much. We now have a requirement that you put those on the plan so that the person who's actually doing the nailing up of say the wood sheathing on the roof has a better sense of exactly where that should go, where that tighter nailing needs to be, where the looser um, spacing can be when you choose to do that. Another change that will only affect a narrow group of buildings, but is different than what we've had was our risk category table has one style of building moving from risk category two to three. And that's our hotels that are very large with a conference center that's connected to them. Most of those hotels stay in risk category two, but when their conference center gets bigger than the hotel, they'll be moving to risk category three, just like normal assembly buildings. So that's, these are really big spaces. With, ones with multiple ballrooms of more than 300 people and a total of 2,500 plus in the multiple ballroom spaces. So not most of them, but that is new and different. Um, other more minor changes are the snow maps becoming similar to ASCE 716 snow maps and the load combinations that we've always been able to find in the IBC or ASCE 7 are now just in ASCE 7 and only the alternate load combinations stay in the IRC. So don't worry when you don't see the others. It will tell you to go to <laughs> ASCE 7. <laughs> they didn't get wiped out. <laughs> 
I'm guessing you've gotten asked that question before. <laughs> oh yeah. Mostly it was the nailing patterns in the wood chapter, but yes. <laughs> And so Sandra, so you mentioned there are some small changes, but what about the changes to the structural observation and special inspections? So can you elaborate on those and explain um, how those changes in particular will affect structural engineers? Okay, so structural observation is gonna be the big one. Previously, if you weren't in a high wind or high seismic area, there was no structural observation required. You could always add it. Um, but it wasn't required. And there's been a concern that big arenas, um, your skyscrapers that are going in, if they weren't in a high seismic or high wind area, there was no big picture check that the structural frame was going up correctly. So we now have a requirement, if it's a risk category three building, which means it holds a lot of people or risk category four building. So our emergency services, those will require no matter where you are in the country, a structural observation. So they'll have their normal building department inspection, they'll have special inspections for their materials, and then they'll add on that structural observation. That's just a third check. So that's the biggest one. Mass Timber, of course, has some special inspections because it's very new construction and most people haven't seen it. Um, there's tweaks to the fire stop and concrete special inspections that you'll see if you focus in those areas. And then uh, lastly, just for the building department, actually less for structural engineers, when deep foundations are going in or going wrong, there was no requirement before that said for the building department that you will stop construction, you will bring out a geotech and they'll evaluate what's going on. That's now in the code too. Yeah, thanks for that. That's that's pretty useful. And uh, thanks for me to watch out for during the, the next cycle. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, and speaking of the codes, uh, buddy, uh, could you, because uh, I've always wondered, because I use, you know, the codes frequently at work. And I sometimes wonder how these codes even get written. Could you explain the process of what it takes and what the research it takes to develop these codes and how the codes even become codes or these new provisions get in there? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And um, so uh, through the ICC process, we develop what are called model codes. And because of the way our country is structured, um, the enforcement of building codes and inspections is really at the grassroots level, at the local level. So when ICC develops a national model code, then a, a local jurisdiction would need to adopt that. Uh, and that gives it the force of law. And then building officials who are appointed by local governments use that code um, to um, inspect and, and um, do plan check for buildings. And so the process within ICC um, is a three-year cycle. And um, there's a whole family of codes, more than a dozen different codes. The most familiar for structural engineers are going to be the International Building Code, the International Residential Code, to a certain extent, maybe the Fire Code. Um, and so committees and individuals, structural engineers associations can come to the code change. They can propose a co uh, code change. Anyone can comp propose a code change. And then there are a series of hearings, first committee hearings, and then public comment hearings. And then the membership of ICC does a final vote on all the new provisions that have been proposed and work their way through that process. And so after every three year cycle, then a new uh, series of codes are published. Then it's again up to the local jurisdictions to adopt those. And a lot of jurisdictions don't adopt every three years, might be on a six year cycle or even uh, longer. And so they have, we have in, you know, in the US, if you were to look at a map, just a lot of different states with a lot of different codes, that makes our job interesting, because when we go out to teach, you know, we don't know whether we're teaching the new 2021 or 2018 or 2015 codes. And so we've got this whole library of programs to teach, depending on which version of the code is in force. 
yeah, that sounds really like what you were saying, even with the, uh, the whole process of just getting code changes. Now you got to think about the, the local jurisdiction, which takes precedence and okay, what are they, what are they using? Do they even take the latest codes up or are they working in, in, on older codes? So yeah, that's very interesting to see how that whole process gets done. Yeah, and I think one thing that's also really interesting, and Matt, maybe you can provide some input, is that some engineering offices adopt like the 2021 code across all of their offices, regardless of jurisdiction. And so sometimes they're designing to a code in like the 2018 building code, which I think is the one I'm most familiar with when it's like a 2015 is the jurisdictional. It's really interesting how those types of, those types of things overlap. Yeah, even for engineers, it's it's different because we always have to go to, <laughs> I can feel what uh, <laughs> what ICC goes through because we always have to go, we're at the mercy of the local jurisdictions as well. So <laughs> yeah, and everyone wants <laughs> to change codes too. Yeah, and everyone wants to build these mass timber buildings, which are 2021, but they don't necessarily want to adopt the 2021 building codes <laughs> at the jurisdictional level. It's, it's yeah. interesting. And we try to, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting for sure. <laughs> so, so buddy, since you do have so much experience with, um, you said you worked for the American Wood Council before you joined with ICC. Can, how do mass timber buildings compare to concrete or steel buildings? So all these materials have a place, uh, obviously in lots of different applications and from a safety standpoint, when the committee developed the mass timber provisions, they keyed the fire safety or fire resistance ratings. If you're familiar with table 601 of the code, it establishes the fire ratings for different building elements. So for the three new types of construction, um, they keyed type four, the, the new provisions to type one construction, type 1A and 1B. And so the fire protection for primary structural uh, elements, for example, uh, for um, type 4A is three hours comparable to type 1A construction. And so there's um, there are similarities there in, in the sense that the fire protection requirements are comparable. Um, now, the, the height limits and area limits are going to be um, different. We can only go up to 18 stories and 270 feet with mass timber, whereas a lot of your concrete and steel buildings in type one can, you know, are unlimited. But uh, nonetheless, the, this is a, a big step for um, the wood uh, products industry being able to go beyond six stories and 85 feet, which is what, what our limit for heavy timber. Now, as far as a lot of times we get questions about cost, what's the cost differential? Well, you can't just say compare a precast concrete panel with a CLT panel and, and stop there because where the real cost savings occurs is with the construction time, which is greatly reduced. The weight of the materials is greatly reduced, which means your foundation systems are smaller. Um, and the labor required is greatly reduced. So if you look at big picture, you know, from start to finish with the um, construction process, that's where uh, the industry is finding that mass timber really has um, some huge potential. Um, plus folks like architects who are interested in the um, green credits, uh, environmental performance, wood sequesters carbon. And so there, uh, there's a good environmental message there uh, for wood products as well. Yeah, I think a big conversation um, just in the past couple of years has been sustainability and the uh, carbon emissions reduction. And it was, I sat in on a case study and it was, um, it was a building actually done in, I guess it was maybe Arkansas. And they shipped in all of the CLT panels from Austria, but they did the calculations on the CO2 emissions of just shipping all of the, those like cross laminated timber panels that they all just like connect together, like Lincoln logs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did that analysis against a concrete and steel construction. And I think the time it took 
to like recomp all of the carbon emissions would have just been like 22 years. And the service life of the building, I think was built out to like 50 or something like that. And they were like, yeah, by the time it like, it will essentially be start sucking carbon out of the air by the end of its life cycle. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. It was really, it was a cool scenario to look through. Well, and the other point to follow up on that is that we now have domestic CLT manufacturers here in the U.S. So we're no longer shipping across the sea, which is an even better scenario. Yeah, there's, um, so it's really funny. There is, uh, so <laughs> I was talking about this when I was at Structures Congress. I think um, there's a plant in Alabama. It's a new one. And um, it used to supply, I don't know if y'all know international paper, but it was a paper mill. It was the same, uh, like forest and forestry area. And I was like, I guess with everyone going to digital and removing their paper, they just like delved into a new market, which is cross laminated timber. Makes sense. But I had a really good friend who worked at international paper and she was like, yeah, it's kind of odd. Cause we're all going digital. She was like, I'm looking for something else. But I was like, huh, I wonder what would impact that particular economy because because we also have these pine forests that are, they're super quick growing pine in Alabama. And they have like a, I think it's maybe like a 15 to 20 year um, growth cycle. Um, and they just make all sorts of wood. So I was, that was interesting when I saw that because I'm originally from Alabama. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Even what, what you mentioned, buddy, I think one of the things that stood out to me when I was seeing uh, some photos of mass uh, timber construction is the, the the manpower needed to install those. It's basically one man on a crane and then maybe a couple people, maybe two or three people to just place it. And that that's all they need to construct it. So it's really interesting to see where, where mass timber is going and, and um, you know, with the help of the codes, more and more acceptance of it. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes in maybe the next five years. Uh, my last question uh, for me, for Sandra, is uh, still code related, uh, but I just wanted to see, we talked about the structural observations and some of the significant changes. What about, were there any maybe less significant changes that were going in terms of concrete, steel, uh, masonry, and wood requirements? <laughs> Since so much of our um, code requirements for the various materials are now in the material standards, the big things in the IBC are simply a reference to a new standard. So we have a new reference for ACI 318, it'll be the 2019 edition. Um, for the first time, we have concrete tolerances directly referenced in the code. So for cast in place concrete, ACI 117 is now being referenced. And for precast concrete, it's ITG 7. So tolerances that we never had before you had to go out to the concrete standards and then go from there are directly referenced. Um, in steel, similarly, we have AISC 358 for the pre-qualified connections for seismic requirements. That's actually directly referenced as well. And then in wood, we just are updating our um, special design provisions reference to the 2021 code. So all of that is just code references off to standards smart yeah let them handle it right <laughs> yeah, it's been the way we've been going for a couple decades so yeah um so buddy and sandra to end off here um do you do could both of you share some final advice that we could give to young engineers starting off in their career or maybe to our professionals engineers maybe looking to pivot a little bit in their career. And since, since we started with you, Sandra, maybe we'd go with Buddy first. <laughs> okay. Uh, my advice would be get out onto the job site. So, you know, it's nice. A lot of us have been working from home. We have this nice little comfortable place where we can do our work and do Zoom meetings or, or whatever. But getting out to the job site, seeing how the design actually is implemented in the field, all the different uh, inspections that are happening and, and the issues that builders are dealing with in the field and what, the impact that your tolerances have on that whole construction process 
is a really, really valuable um, part of, I think, your your growth uh, in the in the field and and really becoming um, a better engineer just from the standpoint of knowing how to to practically design things that can be easily implemented in the field. Sandra, <laughs> yeah, and I uh, I completely agree. The the most common problem in construction is that people aren't talking to one another and don't realize that something that they think is going to work nicely actually doesn't work. Um, the other thing would be just don't be afraid to try new things. It, whether it's saying, okay, sure, I, I'll take this project at work, or it's something outside of work, a committee that you can be on, um, an activity you go do. It's the more you try new things, the quicker you'll find out what you enjoy doing the most. I think that is great advice to any of our listeners. Specifically, I think giving out on the job is so important because you're right. Everything looks really great in a 2D or a 3D model, but actual application on a project sometimes just screams like not knowing the application how you designed it (laughs) and then Sandra yeah trying new things me and Matt talk all the time about kind of putting yourself out there and doing different things just to get the experience and it's I think it's also good just to find out if you actually like doing something or maybe not so I think that's amazing feedback to uh, our listeners yeah I definitely agree with all those and can definitely relate to um, we'll do a instructional engineering, we'll do a pretty sketch, send it out to the field. And then I was like, well, this isn't what we're, <laughs> this, it's not going to work. And then, yeah, it, it and it, a lot of it can be resolved by either going out to the field or even just a phone call that, that communication that, that you were talking about, uh, see what they're going through, you know, throw out some solutions. They might have better solutions since they are out in the field and they work with it every day. So uh, just having that uh, communication uh, especially for young engineers, just get on the phone and go talk to them. <laughs> It'll save you a lot of headaches. That's <laughs> uh, so great advice. And I just wanted to thank both of you for, you know, for all that you do. And it definitely affects uh, the, the building industry and structural engineers in general. And uh, thanks for their time. And thanks for this great conversation. I learned a lot. Thanks for having us today. Yeah, thanks. All right, y'all. Thank you again. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 79, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.